What is infinity? And are all infinities the same size, i.e. infinite, or are some infinities bigger than the others? Today, we're going to explore this amazing phenomenon called infinity. First, let me tell you why I decided to make this video. Many moons ago, I made a video called Zeno's Paradox. And I got a lot of good comments on this video. But a recent one caught my attention. One viewer had asked me, can you define infinity? And so I thought, yes, that's a good idea. But I set myself a challenge here. I'll attempt to explain infinity without using any math jargon. The idea is to define infinity in terms of the language that the common man uses on the street. So with that challenge, without further ado, let's get started. So let's start from the start. What is infinity? Now, to most people, infinity basically means something that's undefinable, unlimited, and uncountable. For example, in everyday parlance, it's common to say that the universe is infinite, or that the number of stars in the sky at night is infinite, or that the number of sand grains on all the beaches and deserts in the world is infinite. Similarly, the number of sentences that you can make in English, or for that matter, any language, is infinite. One of the first historical observations of infinity takes us to India with the 24th and the last Tirthankara or prophet of Jain religion. His name was Mahavir and he lived between 599 BCE to 521 BCE. The religion that he propagated is called Jainism. The Jains were the first to distinguish between things that go on without ending and things that are truly limitless. Even more interestingly, they had different dimensions of limitlessness. The Jains had a concept of infinite in one direction, infinite in two directions, infinite in area, infinite in volume, and infinite perpetually. Another observation of infinity in human history takes us to Pythagoras, who lived from 580 to 500 BCE. Pythagoras and his followers initially believed that any aspect of the world could be expressed by just the whole numbers. But they were surprised to discover that the diagonal and the side of a square are incommensurable. What does that mean? It basically means that, for example, let's just say we have a square that has a side of, I don't know, 12 centimeters. To Pythagoras' surprise, the diagonal of this square can never be measured as a whole centimeter. In other words, the diagonal can never be 13 or 15 or 19 or 21 or 2000, the diagonal would never be a whole unit. Pythagoras was baffled by this strange observation. Of course, today, we know that in a square with sides of length 1, the diagonal is always square root of 2. It's basically 1.414213562 until infinity. It's a never-ending sequence of digits with no particular pattern. What does that mean? It means we can never find the actual real value of the square root of 2. In other words, the square root of 2 is an irrational number with an infinite number of digits after the decimal point. Isn't that amazing? Just like we have some people in our lives who are always utterly irrational and difficult to deal with, we have numbers that are very difficult and irrational, and we call them irrational numbers. Now, think about it for a second. We have a very simple yet very strange observation here. We can physically see the start and end of a diagonal on a square. We can point out the beginning and the end of this diagonal. But the diagonal itself is an infinite number that can never be actually calculated in terms of its real number value. Irrational numbers such as the diagonal of a square are mathematical infinities but have finite physical lengths. So it's physically finite but mathematically infinite. Now, let's move on to Zeno of Aelia. So Zeno lived from 495 BC to 430 BC, and he came up with his paradoxes, which talked about infinitesimally small space fragments and time fragments, was not to make people actually believe that movement is impossible. On the contrary, he wanted to bring home the point that not everything can be explained just by pure logic. 
logic has its own limitations. Later, English philosopher Bertrand Russell and Austrian logician Kurt Gödel would carry on Zeno's legacy of finding limitations and paradoxes in a system of pure logic. But that's a story for another day. Coming back to our original topic, let's see what Plato and Aristotle thought about infinity. They both abhorred the idea of infinity. Aristotle said that there is no actual infinity, and nobody paid much attention to infinity for more than a millennium. Now enters the next hero of our story of infinity, Galileo Galilei. Galileo discovered a paradox, famously called Galileo's paradox, that made him scratch his head for a plausible explanation but to no avail. In fact, it's so simple that even you can do it with just a pencil and paper. All you need to do is draw a circle on a piece of paper just like this. Now, draw a triangle in that circle and make sure the vertices must meet the circumference of the circle. Okay, so let's do it. Now, draw a square, now a regular pentagon, okay, a regular hexagon, and on and on and on. A regular decagon, which has 10 sides, looks more like a circle than a regular octagon. A regular hectagon with one-handed side looks a better circle than a decagon. A regular Kiliagon, which has 1,000 sides, looks an even better circle. In fact, to the human eye, a regular Megagon with a million sides looks as good as a real circle. In principle, we can say that a circle is a regular Infinigon. In fact, I did a similar experiment where I made a circle from straight lines. Now, it's not very sophisticated, but it's good enough to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. You can watch it here. So. Basically, a circle can be formed from an infinite number of sides, each one infinitesimally small in length. Connect all of them and you get a circle. So far so good. But then he went a step further and reasoned, what if I do another bigger circle with the same center as the original circle but with twice the radius and so twice the circumference of the original circle. In simple terms, if you cut the circle and make a straight line of it, then the straight line that's formed by the inner circle will be half in length than the straight line formed by cutting the outer circle and laying it into a line. Now, to Galileo's surprise, if you draw an infinitesimally sharp line from each point on the outer circle to the center, then each of these lines from the outer circle will also pass through a point on the inner circle and then only it can reach the common center. So basically each point, let's say P, on the outer circle is paired with a unique point, let's call it P dash on the inner circle. So that means that the number of points on the outer circle and the number of points on the inner circle is the same. But how is that possible? You see, the outer circle has a circumference that's twice the circumference of the inner circle. That means that the number of points on the outer circle should be double the number of points on the inner circle. But obviously, that's not the case. Galileo's thought experiment clearly demonstrates that each point on the outer circle can be paired with a unique point on the inner circle. And that's the paradox. How is that possible? How can the number of infinitesimal points on the outer circle be the same as the number of infinitesimal points on the inner circle? For both circles to have the same number of infinitesimal points, either the circumference should be the same, which is not true in this case, or the number of infinitesimal points on the outer circle should be twice in number than the infinitesimal points on the inner circle, which is not true either. And that is the paradox. This circle paradox also led Galileo into thinking about other things such as numbers. For example, let's, uh, let's talk about the natural numbers. So how many natural numbers do we have? Well, we have an infinite number of natural numbers starting with 1 and continuing to 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 and on and on until infinity. Now, let's look at the set of the squares of these natural numbers. So the square of natural number 1 is 1. The square of natural number 2 is 2 times 2 equals 4. The square of natural number 3 is 3 times 3 equals 9. And similarly, the square of 4 is 16. The square of 5 is 25. 
the square of 6 is 36, the square of 7 is 49, the square of 8 is 64, the square of 9 is 81, and the square of 10 is 100, and on and on until infinity. Now, if you look at these two sets, we find that both these sets are infinite. Then Galileo reasoned, let's look at the natural numbers 1 to 100. We have 100 entries in this set, but in the set of the squares of natural numbers, we have only 10 entries. I think. Let's look at it. 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, 36, 49, 64, 81, and 100. Only 10 entries. So, if you consider numbers between 1 and 100, there are only 10 entries in the squares set, but there are 100 entries in the natural number set. So, if you continue them to infinities, of course, there should be more natural numbers than there are squares of natural numbers. But at the same time, both of these series of numbers, these sets, are infinite, isn't it? You have an infinite number of natural numbers, and so you also have an infinite number of their squares. This was confusing to Galileo. And so Galileo concluded, we cannot speak of infinite quantities as being the one greater or less than or equal to another. Galileo, despite his brilliance, couldn't wrap his head around this strange idea of infinity. Galileo came very close to understanding infinity, but he probably was not prepared to rock the boat any further, especially when the church was already unhappy with him or his telescopic discoveries that proved that the earth revolves around the sun. As a result, on January 26, 1616, Galileo was banned and banished by the Catholic Church which eventually led to Galileo's house arrest for eight years. That's all Galileo could contribute to the argument of mathematical infinities. Now enters the main hero of our story, Georg Cantor. Georg Cantor was the first person in the history of humankind who actually defined infinity in concrete terms. And he did that despite being harshly treated by his contemporaries, suffering extreme bouts of depression, and being denied even the most basic respect by his critics. This story is heartbreaking. But at the same time, it's the story of a driven man who not only redefined math with his set theory, but also defined infinity and created a new math out of it. Now, we all know that 1 plus 1 equals 2. Cantor now asked a very profound question. What is infinity plus infinity? When Galileo was confronted with this question, he simply said, we don't know. This puzzle was finally resolved by Cantor in the beginning of 1873. I can tell you the basic techniques that Cantor used were so simple that even someone without any higher understanding of mathematics can logically understand how he proved that some infinities can be bigger than other infinities. Now, before we embark on the journey, it's very important that we understand a few simple mathematical terms. The first is what we call a set. What is a set? A set is basically a group of things. For example, if you go shopping for groceries, the household items in your basket, it's a set of household items. Similarly, let's say in a classroom, there are 35 students. So these 35 students are in a set. So basically, a set is nothing but a group. The second thing that we must understand is size of a set. The size of a set means how many things are inside this group. For example, a set of 35 students and a basket full of 35 household items. Both are sets of equal sizes. Now, one of the very simple but powerful techniques that Cantor used is called one-to-one -one correspondence. So, what is one-to-one -one correspondence? Let's find out. First of all, why do we need one-to-one -one correspondence? We can use this simple but amazing technique to find if two sets are of equal sizes or not. So, in our previous example, the number of students in a classroom compared to the number of items in a grocery basket. That's easy to count. We can simply count up to 35. It doesn't take much time. But imagine a situation where the sets are so big that there are hundreds of thousands of items in each of these sets. For example, let's imagine a school gymnasium. All the boys and girls from each class in each section of the school are asked to come down and stand in the gymnasium. Now, 
What if you are given the task of finding if the number of boys and the number of girls is the same or not? One way is you count the number of girls and then you count the number of boys and you compare the numbers. But that will take a lot of time. There are thousands of students. A much simpler way is using the one-to-one -one correspondence. You can simply ask each boy to couple up with a girl. If there is one or more than one girls left, the number of girls is more than the number of boys. If one or more than one boys are left, we can say the number of boys is more than girls. This technique is called one-to-one -one correspondence. Now, if you remember, Galileo was talking about this one-to-one -one correspondence when he said that for each natural number, there is a square of that number. He was talking about one-to-one -one correspondence, but he didn't know because this term had not been invented yet. So, now we understand one-to-one -one correspondence is a very simple way of finding if two sets with hundreds of thousands or millions or billions of things are of equal sizes or not. If each item in one set can couple with a unique item in the other set, we can say there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between these two sets, and hence these two sets are equal in size. They have the same number of items in them. Cantor used this simple but powerful technique of one-to-one -one correspondence to prove that some infinities are bigger than others. To understand how Cantor proved that some infinities are bigger than others, in a more intuitive way, we need to go to the world-famous Hilbert Hotel. But this video is already more than my 15 minutes limit, so I'm going to stop it here. In the next episode, we'll talk in detail about the Hilbert Hotel paradox and how Cantor proved fair and square that some infinities are bigger than the others. Thank you for watching the video till the end, and if you really liked it, please don't forget to subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one. Until then, bye-bye.